Wait, hold on. Fucking, we are recording, but my microphone wasn't with me. Chris Brown in the H Hour Studio. Welcome. Thank you for having me. How did you find the icebreaker? Um, challenging for some strange reason. The most simplest questions you could give, and I didn't have a decent response from well, any. You, you got uncharacteristic, <laughs> un- uncharacteristic for, for guests, amazed by some questions. So, what book are you currently reading? Wow. Wow. Because, ooh. I didn't want to say. <laughs> I didn't want to say AZ fundamentals of cloud and bore the living daylight. No, as you say, wow, well, it's several questions. It's quite amusing. It's quite amusing. <laughs> some people, some people find the, the icebreaker really difficult because they they'd like direct, strangers direct questions. Whereas the podcast, now we're just shooting the shit now. It's like, it's, just, it's like no pressure to give a fa- like a fantastic answer in your mind. You don't need yeah. to give a fantastic. It's just shooting the shit, right? Question for you. So, twenty six years you served for, mm-hmm. right? Across a variety of units. Yes. Uh, do you think? It becomes easier to. It's easier to, to transition from the military to civilian, the higher up the ranks you go. And the reason I ask that is because the higher up the ranks you go, the more exposed to civilian life you get, more exposure to commercial world you get, more interaction with civvies you have to have. So you kind of, you've gone through like a, maybe the ten first ten fifteen years of a career is institutionalization, mill, 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 but as you go up the ranks, there's more interaction with the community and stuff, isn't there, and politicians and all that kind of shit. What do you reckon? Um, I don't necessarily agree with that sentiment in that <clears throat> as you grow up into, you know, grow into the latter ranks of um, sergeant majors through to, you know, commissioning, etc., that you're actually that exposed. Depend- it's dependent upon the jobs that you're in, I suppose. Yeah, um, yeah good point. So, um, you know, I think you... Even, I think as you get older, I think it's more difficult to transition. I think it's a difficult journey. Um, I think you are more, I don't like the word institutionalised, but you're more ingrained into those, the ways, methods of what the military looks like. So if you've done those 26 years, it's really hard then to jump into another environment and it is it is a it is a completely different world a different environment to transition into so i think you know you're older you're not necessarily much wiser in that world so i think it's really difficult the younger you know if the, the guys or girls that have done the, you know the, the 12 to 15 years you know they've, they've got something under the belt they, you know they've got some training they've got a little bit of confidence they've they've bought you know i think they can very quickly transition but yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say it's any. It's easier for the the long servers like myself. Yeah, In fact, it was it horrific. <laughs> Depends on mindset as well, doesn't it? I I I did eleven years, mm-hmm. and I I I reckon my so I left in two thousand and eleven. I'd say my transition didn't really. I didn't really transition fully out until maybe the last two years. I'd say. Yeah. Really, like it's been that long, and I think it's because I went from the mill to the Middle East doing private security, mm-hmm. which was, I mean, you're still in the same environment, like even geographically, you know, and you're in the same, you're around the same kind of people. And then when I came back from there, I only did like four years. I came back from there trying to get a job in the UK, a, like a, a proper job in the UK. I say proper, a nine to five job in the UK. Yeah. I was no better off than the four years before. I didn't understand the commercial world at all. I didn't, like, I, I thought, for example... You know, a, a company that does comms, everyone in that, everyone in that company is a, is a comms geek, an ex-signaler. You know, I was that naive. I didn't realise, uh, it sounds ridiculous, but I didn't know about HR departments. I didn't know, like, like project management. Yeah. I didn't know, about, like, it's, it's obvious, obvious now. But, and that, bear in mind, I was, like, 34, 35. Yeah, yeah. And that, that massive knowledge gap is crazy. It's crazy. I think it's taken me maybe six or seven years to understand those type of competencies. You know the business, the commercial, you know, how it fits together, regardless of the qualifications that you are. Uh, you know, you go and you, you go and learn um, for, for your specific trades. Learning that commercial element is it's only you're only going to learn that once you leave and got to throw yourself into that. I specifically chose not to jump into that military environment. You know, going out and doing, you know, whether it be intelligence work or clearing minds from a previous, but you know that sort of combat type of world I chose definitely not to do that but I didn't transition at all not one bit I failed I failed absolutely failed royally at transitioning royally I just chose to leave I don't know what you mean um I mean I was a resettlement officer so I was teaching people you know the two years prior to them leaving yeah 
I was giving them advice. This is what you do. This is how you do it. This is the steps you take. Um, this is what your family should be doing. These are the courses you should do. Um, I was given an opportunity. I was so desperate to leave. And I was given an opportunity, which wasn't a great opportunity. And I just jumped at it and just clicked the seven clicks to freedom whilst I was on a course, a career course, and just went, oh, I've done it. I've got, I think I've made the right decision. Did no courses, no training. Clicked the button. It all went really wrong. Lost, lost so much. What was the job you're going to have to do? Um, somebody offered me a, a an investment into a, a into a, um, a business, um, logistics business. Knew nothing about again. Oh. Knew, knew nothing about logistics. Knew nothing about any of it. How it worked, like yourself. No commercial experience. Um, yeah, invested in it. All went wrong. So one minute I'm commanding and leading. Um, I was the last unit I was with the Gurkhas. Um, so gone through gone through all that twenty six years of leadership and management. Within six weeks, I'm driving a van, dropping parcels off. Oh my god! Who was this person? Who was it? A friend? Family member. Oh. <laughs> so there's two, <laughs> two royal, two royal problems there, and they don't go into business with family. Tick number one. Fuck that up. Um, yeah. Don't in, don't invest in things that you don't know about. Yeah. Fuck that one up. Tick number two. Yeah. Yeah, all went really wrong. How do I, how do I escape from that? I, you know, I've I've learned that myself. I learned the lesson myself and broken it twice. Don't go into don't go into business with family or friends is is the rule. Yeah, and I just, but but I did it. I've done it twice, and the second time's worked out all right. But the first time was a nightmare. I just but, but at the same time, your family and friends are the people you trust the most. So it's kind of you're more inclined to believe. Mm. Not that I'm not suggesting this family member's lying to you. But you're more inclined to want what they're suggesting to work, be, yeah. pay more, to, uh, pay, you pay more attention to it, willing to take a bit more risk, you know, nightmare. I was vulnerable. Nightmare. It, I think, and it's something I learn now when I speak to people who want to come into the business and, you know, want to transition into to, to my field into a certain cyber. It's like, I know they are at a vulnerable point in their lives. They don't know everything. They're at that, they're at that point where in the icebreak about, you know, what were you like at 16 or 17? What, what advice could you give? These are people in the the forties and and the, they're still vulnerable now. They're as vulnerable as what they were when they were at sixteen, seventeen when they were joining. So I know what it's like to be that vulnerable. I know what it's like to try and gain the education and experience to make them more aware of what they're doing. Because they'll jump sometimes jump at anything. They literally will jump at anything because mm -hmm. they want to get out and they think you know the first job they go for. I want to get it. I need I need to secure a job. And then, yeah, you just, it's a, just a vulnerable time. It was just terrible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean even just uh, even just applying for work and get, and getting rejected is horrendous. Because you have, I, I don't know why I had an expert, I did not expect, well, I expected to have a higher success rate in terms of applying for jobs <laughs> or even just getting responses when in reality it just doesn't happen. I, I think at one point I had about 200 applications in across for different jobs, but most of them was through the online job portals. They were just collating all the information yeah. from online. And I had all these applications in. And I, I got to a stage where I just, not a tick, but I'd, I'd wake up through, my phone would be next to my bed, and I'd wake up through the night constantly checking it to see if I had any responses, in the middle of the night, to see if I had any responses to any of the applications I made. But that rejection or lack of response has grown me down. It gro I wasn't used to it. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't used to it at all. It was, it was horrendous. But the reality is, you, you most recruiters and most jobs you apply for, you're not going to get a response. You're just not. You're just not, unless unless you're doing something very different to make yourself stand out, which is a, which sounds simple, but it's actually really difficult to be able to do. I think. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I um, I was just really fortunate. Um, mine was leveraging networks and friends. That was the the way in, the recruitment game, the CV game, the CV sifting game. You know, you're getting rejected because words on the page weren't matching the algorithms that were you know monitoring the the cvs etc you'd be like oh, i'm just not going to get anywhere here no. so you just got to leverage the support and, and that's that's still probably the case now but i remember applying for a role and it was in the nuclear industry my first role i'm thinking i've got to go back to what i know i've got to go back to information security i've got to go back to the security and intelligence world that i you know was comfortable with enjoyed it and i was really fortunate i remember it being in the um the office of um, the warehouse 
with all the vans and everything. So I was in the office and um, and I remember the call coming through saying we'd like to award this job, and I sort of cried. I went, oh, fell to my knees. Was like, thank, thank the Lord, I've got this job. You know, it wasn't the greatest job, but I got, a, I got a job. Yeah. I got a foothold. And then from there, you can just sort of, you know, get expand, can't you? And and it's been great since then. That's the thing, isn't it? It's easier to, it's easy to find the job, the right job you want to be, you want to be doing for the rest of your life when you've got a job and you're yeah. employed. It's like take anything to get to where you want to be. Yeah. You may not, and that's a difficult lesson to to um, to communicate. I think people want to leave and go straight into the the, the rest of their life career when they, when they get out, and it's just not, it's just probably not going to happen. But on your point about networking. That I mean, I think that has, like you say, that has to be the primary way people should be seeking to get their jobs when they leave networking, face to face. All the work, all the jobs I've had since I left, and I've had maybe four, five, or six, you know, significant jobs yeah. since I left. All bar one were through people I knew, getting and getting in. They had involved interviews, but I got those interviews not through a CV sift, like you say, but because people I knew yeah. or people that were second or third connection. That knew of me and I was able to reach out to and got the jobs. But um And it's not based upon they know you. I think the thing is there, they know you. They know you as a character, how you behave, you know, whether they like you, all the sort of social skills and the, the human skills. Because people like you, you, you know, you're personable and you know, those type of traits massively align you to some of the business world. It's not necessarily your qualifications that are gonna set you mm. set you free. You know, I think those networks where they go, he's a brilliant guy. You know, he's, he's not a wanker, as I say. You know, no wankers. He's not a wanker. He's a great guy. He'll help you. We can retrain him. We can, you know, he's he's, he's built a great moral fibre. He follows all those disciplines. Everything else can be taught. And um, I think through those networks, they're probably the easiest routes to get into mm. any, other, any any sort of business world. Can I ask a question? Going mm -hmm. back military career, how did you, why did you go from engineers to Inco? Um, I went because I'd, I'd reached, I'd done about 14 years with the engineers, I'd done my recce sergeants, I'd done all the courses, I was qualified, you know, throughout, and I just thought there was just something maybe more, I wanted more of a challenge, I could see the future of the engineers, I could see where I was going, and it wasn't going to give me the mental challenges that I needed at that time when I was in my, um, excuse me, um, probably early 30s, that I needed something else, I could see the next six years being quite boring. I could I could map, I could path it out to going, I'm gonna be going on that op tour. I'm gonna to be doing that, you know, um whatever it would have been, you know. I just could see what it looked like and I wanted an academic challenge. And um and I was a recruiter at the time, I was playing army rugby. Um I'd gone to a recruiting office and a leaflet fell on the desk and they were looking for people with like more combat element skills, I say combat, you know, not like you guys, but in terms of, I was a combat engineer, so they wanted more rounded skills. Um, they wanted people with interviewing techniques, etc. There was just certain skills that they wanted. I thought, I'll, I'll give that a go. And um, to my amazement, even now, where everyone laughs and goes, there's no way that Chris Brown ever went in the intelligence squad in a million years. He's from Yorkshire, there's not a chance. <laughs> It's like this Yorkshire kid has gone into the intelligence world. It's like, yeah, I'll have, I'll, I'll have a give it a go. And I, and I was accepted. And uh, it was probably what it was. It was the best thing I'd ever done. I really missed the core. I love the engineers. Absolutely. There's my heart and soul is Royal Engineers. But, I, you know, equally like the challenge of the intelligence world. And it's and it set me up for my next my next journey till I retire, I think. So, um, but no, oh, good. I've got a good um, vibe for both of those cat badges. What was so different about it? What intelligence go? Yeah, um, I don't know if you can talk about what you're doing, but what was what was so different about it? It was um, it was more it was more thinking, more analytical, um, more 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 on the sort of um, report side in life. Um, you would it, it was the it was the field of disciplines that it that it brought that you could get involved with in terms of counterintelligence, you know, surveillance, human. Wasn't you, know, you could do? There's lots of things that you could really delve into. Um, that was, you know, and there's almost an air of it's it's quite secretive. You know, you're operating in highly sensitive areas with, you know, sensitive information, critical sensitive information on on all sorts. And I really enjoyed that that feel. Um, 
And I wasn't laying on my belly prodding mines. So was, that, was, <laughs> that was always another one, wasn't it? So I always think, oh, it's another winter. We're going to go out on the uh, plains again and put mines in the ground and prod. And, uh, or go on the go on the bridges and put hay ricks around bridges. No. So is it mostly... To, so we, you, I know you're in information security related world now. Was it mostly to do with that kind of work? With operations that were going on? In, in intelligence, yeah, yeah. So the first one was would have been Northern Ireland. Uh, oh, really? My first, my first gig with um, Joint Support Group, which used to be the old FRU sections. Yeah. So it's counterintelligence security for the whole of Northern Ireland, making sure that you know it was we were secure. How so fascinating! It must give you a very different insight into stuff that goes on operate operation operations that were going on with with the military at the time compared to. Your experience when you were combat engineer, for example. Yeah, so so when it was engineering, you were you, you were building, weren't you? You were securing at this time. You're planning. You just make you're making sure, based upon all the intelligence that you were given from all the different intelligence disciplines, that you aligned to the security plans for the protection of the of the uh, you know of all the soldiers and all the camps. You know, so you you would base your security plan on every bit of intelligence that you could find. Um. So it, again, it aligns to it very similarly aligns to what we're doing now in the sort of cyber world. Mine with them was more of a physical aspect, so a massive defence in depth approach to security. Um, I used to, we used to talk about it and teach it, you know, call it an onion, like an onion skin. Work from the outside, from the fences, the lights, down to the weapons, down to the docks, down to the people, and all the intelligence that supports that, just to make sure that. But, you know, when we go on ops, we're secure. So a lot of planning. I really enjoyed the planning rather than doing the digging. Mm. Yeah. And then, so I'm assuming that just that taste of that, that background when you were in the Inc Corps, that, is that what led you to the cyber security world outside then? Yeah. Yeah, no, hugely, because it was an information security type job and role. But firstly, it was the physical. So it would have been all the physical... Um, plans for, like, you know, for places like Sterling Lines, and we used to, you know, you go and inspect and just make sure all the security was in place, right down to the documents. But it's in a, it was in a physical sense. So all the process procedures, the policies, everything that you know, you need to make sure it's secure from a physical sense. I just translated that and used that same methodology that defence in depth methodology, but then understand the cyber world, translate that into, you know, what what IT looks like, but use the same model. That's how I that's how I still So sorry, so the so so physical um protection of camps and like the like you said, the layers, the protection against not nice people trying to get access to information or mm -hmm. things. That responsibility for assessments and planning lies with the Inc Corps. Yeah. I didn't know I didn't never knew that. I never thought about it before, though. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it makes sense. Now I think about it. It's intelligence-based security, isn't it? Threat-based mm. threat, intelligence-based security. What's the threat? Apply proportionate security measures to that threat. Make sure that the proportionate security measures meet a certain standard. Make sure that people are operating within them, follow against the rules and the processes to make sure it fits. So before you go into any fob or whatever you're going into, threat-based analysis. What's the what's the you know the best security measures proportionate security measures that need to go into that um, environment, same as it was in Helmand, same as it was in Kabul, and same it was in the FOBs. Same process, same it was in Northern Ireland. What years were you there in Cork? Two thousand and ooh, two thousand and two to about two thousand and eleven, something like that. Because and the reason I ask is the information security world was changing at a rapid fucking rate during that time, wasn't it? Absolutely. When Facebook, 2007, Twitter was 2007, wasn't it? You had smartphones come about, what, 2004, 2005, 2006, smartphones started coming about. Hmm. People started getting loosey-goosey with their personal security, uh, as did serving soldiers, sailors and airmen and women. Absolutely. How did uh, That must have been a bit, of a, a bit of a nightmare to try and um, move and change with the times. If you, well, it's interesting. Yeah. I, was, I was sent to a, a unit... Um, um, 
down south. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was a anti-terrorist anti-terrorist advisory training unit, and it was specifically there to inform all the troops on the threat um, threat actors um, against specific technologies, the capabilities, the tactics, the you know the techniques and procedures that we're using as technology um, sort of increased, like you say, the smartphones. Um, if we think back then, this, the, the security in place from a technology perspective was nowhere near where it is now. We weren't even in the same ballpark, but yet we still had the smart technologies and the IOTs, et cetera, that was operating in the environments, which, you know, terrorists were using to some great advantage. So, you know, you've, they've got to be briefed. They were briefed. But you know what squaddies are like. <laughs> They'll bypass anything, won't they? They'll bypass anything. So that was always an interesting, uh, interesting world. So, what about um, what about now? So since you've been out in the same in kind of the same, there's been the same fast paced change, I think, in as there was then. But now with the way states are using, are using. Um, Things like social media tools, things like uh, well, they, you're basically going much more uh, focused on trying to breach yeah. other state security information security measures to yeah. uh, to, to to cause a massive chaos. In, but but they, they, sorry, they, but they go in for commercial entities as well, right? No, absolutely. So yeah, talk about that if you can. Probably more commercially, re really, and research and development. Okay. So the offensive ops through social media is obviously huge. So it's almost like um, we termed it in those days now, like psychological operations. So the psyops, offensive ops in that area through social media, um, influencing is still massive. It's still part of a, you know, a big um, threat vector from nation states, um, which we're seeing cons consistently. But yeah, certainly more in a, a commercial and um, research, research and development crew and critical national infrastructure. Not to forget critical national infrastructure, which, which I'm talking about: water, nuclear. Energy, uh, some government sectors, etc. So, yeah, and it's something that the, the operational technology side is not necessarily, um, I would say, not as secure. But the focus is not always on the operational technology, and it, and it poses probably one of the biggest safety threats to the country, probably. Really, so um, is is it? Um, what I'm right, right in saying that it's. China are the ones that are, are, are the main threat at the moment because uh, I can't imagine Russia have got much uh, got a huge capability. It's saying that it says they have. I mean, the media says they have, but I seem to think they they've got less capability than than the media say. Or am I talking rubbish? Uh, do you know what? I'm not. You know, and I wouldn't want to be mis misplaced on anything. I'm not a counter threat sort of advisor. Um, you know. Who are the who are the you know the main players in, in you know the main threat actors have always consistently remained the same main players and threat actors. Um, it's, it's always going to be the you know the, the, what we used to term the the casual countries, the countries to which security reg regulations apply. You know the big fives. So you know it's it's still I don't know, without going into detail, they, they, you know, they're still there, they're still active, um, and yeah, both of those nation states are still. Um, targeting our industries. What kind of in, what kind of in, what kind what are their preferred industries industries to target? Apart from the critical national infrastructure, right? Um, what what are they looking at targeting? Because you mentioned R and D as well. So what are they looking at? Um, well, we spend billion we spend billions of pounds. It depends, you know, we spend spend billions on research. You know, look at the nuclear sector. You know, uh, how how much they're they're working to reduce um, uh, nuclear waste. You know, the research into that. The research into um, the um, technologies that are going into space, you know, there are there are nation states out there that don't want to spend billions in that area. Will quite happily take that information and use it. Uh, it's a, it's a cheap way, cheap route to market for most of these countries. So, was the question around what sectors they specifically targeting? Do you know what? I, I, It's a, it's a tough one. I, I don't want to be misquoted on it, but I think I can have an opinion, obviously. But I, you know, com commercially, finance. There's things that cripple countries, and there's certain mm. things that would cripple 
you know, and I think finance is one of them, government sectors and finance. I think I saw, I, I saw, I heard, a, read a recent report, and it was it was to do with the states about how vulnerable the the, the power infrastructure was and the power stations were, how vulnerable they were, and how, how far behind their their security measures were, not physically, but um, uh, virtually, digitally. What's the right term? What's the opposite of physical? Uh, virtual. Virtual. The virtual world. Virtual. The virtual world. <laughs> Operational technology. Yeah, virtual world, and I imagine it's not. We're not too. It's not too different for us. Um, uh, but I may be wrong. But how, so, how do you? What's the what's the methodology to go toward to protecting yourself against these kind of threats? Um, firstly, have a good um, detection and response capability. Yeah, I try trying for a sort of listener or viewer, trying to think of that physical world for people that really don't understand the virtual world. Try and think of the physical world. And the first thing you do in the physical world is to think about the boundaries and the protections and the detents and, 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 and you know, the, if we could say the patrolling. So you look at the any camp you've been in, the first barrier is the, the, the fence, isn't it? The gates, the guards, the lights, the <coughs> intruder detection systems. So think physical, but then look at the technologies in a virtual world, you know, the extended detect and response capabilities. Um, so the protect and response the protect and response capabilities tooling that protects networks has to be like, you know, spot on, you know, it's, um, it's the first barrier, isn't it? It's the first barrier. Give me an example of that tooling. Um, well, there are, so they, they, there are, there are, there are a variety, a variety of security incident event response. Um, tools out there um, from you know leverage used in Microsoft, AWS, different systems that they can uh, they can leverage. Um, don't particularly, I mean, Lee might know <laughs> probably more about the, the the key tooling. What's the tooling, Lee? Oh, you got it's got no microphone. Oh, no, he's not here. What's the tooling? Example, come on. Sentinel. Oh yeah, that's one of them. He's a typical one. He could go on. I mean, they're, they're more like brands, aren't they? So it's more. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 A, I'm always really, really con you know, cautious about, you know, when somebody says, oh, what tool, you know, giving, you know, like solutions. It's, yeah. It really is, you know, the, the solutions are just part of that boundary defense, that well, firewall. Uh, firewall's a good one, right? So people know the word firewall. Mm -hmm. They'll think, oh, that does something to do with computers and protection and stuff. Explain firewall for people. A firewall um, is it, it's exactly what you're probably saying on the tin. It is that it is that physical fence. It's it's a it's a technology whereby it recognises um, malicious activity or code. Um, it reads the code, and when I say code, I'm trying not to take it too deep, but it's going to recognise what is classed as malicious code as it's coming across the network, across the wire. It will read it, understand that it is you know, it's recognised as being malicious. Um, and prevents it, it stops it, it blocks it, and it doesn't come into the network. The firewall is the front gate with the guards the on it, right? It is. Yeah. And it's checking your ID card. This is good. I like this. I'm learning. Go on. It's checking your ID card. And on those credentials... Why are we working IT? <laughs> yeah. It's checking, the ID. it's checking your ID card. It's saying you're not coming in or you're coming in based upon those recognized signatures on the ID card in a physical term. Excellently put. Yeah. And you go, you're not coming in today. But equally, people can doctor ID cards, can't they? They can doctor credentials. So we've always got to be one step ahead. They've got to be finely tuned. Your guards have got to be finely tuned to recognise the difference between a good ID card and a bad one and bad credentials. So we constantly finely tune and configure the firewalls to ensure they're up to date. They recognise what code is acceptable, what certificates are acceptable, what's not. If you're not tuning them, then anybody walks through the gate. So it's and again, it's only as good as the people that are managing them, and reviewing them, and keeping them up to date and retuning. Same as it would be on the physical sense with the guards. It's only as good as the guard on the gate. But firewalls are also physical bits of kit as well, aren't they? Absolutely. So you've got two aspects to it. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So um, yeah, firewall configuration key. 
detection response key. Um, but again, I'm always trying to relate it back to what that physical environment looks like with the guards on the gate. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, and it becomes more of a drama if you're outsourcing any of that, any of that protection or that technology to people like, yeah. well, you mentioned some of the companies, AWS or whatever, because yeah. then you're reliant on, that, on what their levels of security are. Yeah, I, th I think, well. and, that's a, and it's a good point. I think um, you've got to provide them with the security requirements. You've got to ensure through you know detailed assurance work that the security levels that you want are absolutely you know nailed at the start. So if you're designing security and you're looking at your detection and response capability, you want to be you know, really clear on what you want that to be tuned to, how, it, how you want it configured, what are the rules for those configures, configurations, how it's managed. You want to know who's managing it, who's responding to it, who's reporting it. Um, equally, when you're sending it out to sort of third parties and vendors, um, you know, some, some people rush to market, so it's like, you know, fix it i want it in now and they pay a lot of money and, you know they put these solutions in which is brilliant they get you know off off the shelf security maybe not maybe not tuned to the level of security you might want so you constantly got to do assurance activity against that so and it's never built in from the start in most cases i see mm. why do you think uh one of the things I've noticed over the last few years is that there's, there is a, a much higher interest in people leaving the military and going into cybersecurity. I first realised this, I had a lady on called um, Liz McCulley, who's an ex-army uh, officer, and she got out and went into, do you know Liz? No, no. Do you know about that? So she went out and got into cybersecurity. That's the first I'd heard of it being suited to ex-mil. I hadn't thought about it. And, uh, and the way you're analogising things there to the physical world and you know the, the uh, camp protection, for, for example, makes sense. But why do you think it's getting more on people's radars now? Because it does, it does seem people are getting out and getting interested in it. An interest in the actual... Um, the industry. The industry, yeah, 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 cyber yeah. industry. I think so like it used to be, oh, I'm going to go out and do CP. <laughs> or I'm going to go out and do project <laughs> management. Now one of the big things is I'm going to go out and get into cyber security. I don't know where that, I don't know where that has come from. I think we're on technology every day, aren't we? We're on our smartphones. The films mm. dictate what we, you know, where our interests lie. You know, there's there's hacking films all over. Every every spy film's got the hackers and you know, it's got there's some element to I don't know, what's the word I'm looking for? Um I don't it sparks an interest, doesn't it? You think, Oh, I could, I could get in that world. That looks interesting. I think I could hack. I think I could get into that system. Well, it was a Ooh. film called Hackers, wasn't it? Do you remember was Hackers? It, yeah, remember it, that? And that was in the 90s. And then, so that was, which I, I enjoyed that film. Pike, it up, I enjoyed that film. Yeah. And then the one, the next one that came along, the big one, was The Matrix. Because <laughs> Neo was a, Neo was a hacker, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, in inverted commas, a hacker. Yeah. He was a, he was a, he was a, a, a geek. No, Lovely, but he was cool. But and he was the one. I think that's the that's the thing. It's cool. If you're the hacker, that's the cool bit. What they don't realise is it's like everybody wants to be they want to be the sniper. You know what I mean? They want to be they want to be the top end. And I'm not saying that because you're sat here, of course. Uh, but everybody wants to be that, don't they? Until when they actually get in, they realise that, hmm, perhaps I'm not the sniper. Perhaps I'm the gate guard. <laughs> perhaps I'm the guy that writes the policies for the sniper. <laughs> Perhaps I check to see if the, the sniper's policy. doing his job. <laughs> yeah, no sniper policies. So, so no I think there, there is a there is a, a huge industry out there within it. But I think, based upon the use of technology, the films, etc. Um, but I also think it's heightened from a learning. You know, there's much more learning around cybersecurity. It's, it's coming into schools. We're teaching it at schools. Mm. It's becoming sometimes part of that curriculum. There's education awareness, so there is a massive awareness for the for the youth um, around it, and it's an, and it's a growing industry. Um, that I just think, yeah, they they all think they can lean into it quite easily, and, and in most cases they can. How does it break down in terms of the different uh, the different paths you can take within in, in, within the industry? Because probably there's a misconception there that everyone needs to be a coder, everyone needs to be some flipping Python geek or. Yeah. Whatever, but it's not. I'm assuming that's not necessarily the case, is it? No, absolutely not. I think um, you know, my analogy would always be that you know you could stack if you if you had to stack all the manuals of cyber security and information security on the floor, you you know you'd be talking, <laughs> you could be talking sort of twenty meters high. You know, you're going to learn all that, and I think it's you know 
the industry's broken down into lots of sectors from the technical the technical services and you know, applications building of applications building of codes um, there's the things around data privacy there are security operation centers the management of firewalls the man management of detection and response there's teams of people that need to do audit and assurance um, there's 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 teams of people that look after data privacy and data protection. You know, there's, there's there's so many sort of fields that you can go into counter, you know, cyber threat intelligence, threat analysts, maybe looking at the code. So whatever whatever skill sets that you think you b can bring to the table, it's not necessarily I'm going to be a coder, I'm going to learn Python, Java. It's that, That's not the case. I certainly would never have gone into that route, never in a million years. I, I've, I've tried it. Even when I did sort of did a master's degree, I was like, oh, part of that section was ethical hacking, which you know I struggled at the time because I didn't have the depth of understanding. Ethical hacking, go on. Oh, don't go there. <laughs> Give me one liner. What's ethical hacking? Ethical hacking. It's the ability to um, to test and validate the security of the systems that are in place. Okay. So you allow somebody to test. Um, your systems pen testing you allow, you allow them to go in there and test it is that the same as pen testing pretty much yeah okay yeah 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 so go in and give them the addresses or you can potentially do it from outside of the the wire again physical it's just like that we used to do and try and get into the don't want to relate it back to physical again but it's it's exactly like trying to break into a break into the camp get through the first gate walk into the offices test the drawers try and go into the drawers, read the information, but we're doing it from a virtual sense. We're doing it from a, a laptop, a set of systems that allow us to traverse the network to see where the vulnerabilities lie. And then when we find them, we go and we fix them. Going back to the physical sense, you lock your doors, you lock your drawers, you put paper in a, you know, in a folder. It's, a, it's a, just, again, it's just the same process. Sorry to keep going back to the physical bit, but for any of the listeners that don't know any of the that side side of life, it's no, no, you know mate, trying to no. like paint a picture of like that defence piece and how to pull it together. No, it makes sense. Is there uh, so a lot of industries are moving towards remote working because it makes sense, but then is it less so within the cyber security world? Because and the reason I ask is because if you're if you're using remote workers and that increases a layer of security you need to worry about because they're off premises for example or they could be in another country like a huge amount of uh, a huge amount of companies outsource certain software related work to places like india where there's like incredibly talented people who yeah who, who uh, you can pay less a lot less <laughs> you've know, been, been blunt about it but is it is there a reluctance to do that in the cyber security world um again i think dependent upon industry dependent upon the level of security that you want um, you know, let's just, you know, critical national infrastructure, uh, government sectors, etc., where highly sensitive information, highly sensitive systems, um, you've got to look at the security requirements that you want for that data and how you want it to be managed. Um, you've got to build that into the contracts and understand um, what security is inbuilt with the vendors and third parties that are working over, overseas or abroad or who's managing it on a day-to-day -day basis. Certainly got to understand what access they've got understand the protocols of security uh, whilst data is, you know, traversing across those network lines and how you can secure that. Um, you know, like I would say, VPN technologies and et cetera, and the, the levels of encryption. So th there, there are some real complexities with managing data overseas. Um, there's certainly complexities around data privacy, different laws against different geographical locations. So it's, it's, um, it's not just a technology piece as well. You know, it's not just that fix of encryption. There's a lot to think about. Um, certainly, there's a human element to think about, um, you know, from the individual who may have access to that. You've got to have the assurances in place and the checks and balances to ensure that the people from these third-party countries can only access what they need to access and have the right to read that access. That's the difficult challenge. Because in most cases, you haven't got people turning up on the front door, asking them, "Can you show me? How, can you show me your access? Can you show me how you do access?" Um, mm -hmm. It's a difficult one to do. All you've got to do is just maybe take the assurances through their contracts, 
which is difficult. So yeah, it's 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 not easy, but people are doing it. It's the cheaper option. Um, but you, again, you've got to just balance your security requirements. What does what what uh, what does entry level look like into the into the industry for someone getting out? So someone that's leaving and thinking, I want to get into the cybersecurity industry. Where would they start? Oh, I, I, for me, they would just they, there are, there are an absolute plethora of um, um, free training providers out there um, who would do basic information security um courses there's comp tia courses which are a little bit more technical there comp are comp tia you comp comp tia i think that that's okay. a, yeah um that's a, a starting entry level type for of, free uh they're not they're not free unfortunately um but there are providers you know that microsoft do a lot of free services for looking at cloud security as well um there are um certainly if you're in the military you know there's there's um, organizations like TechVets who provide Tech Vets, yeah. Tech Vets, who provide a, um, a large amount of free range of courses. I would always, you know, push people onto uh, into those. There's, you know, the commercially cybery cheap courses like they can do, you know, to get an understanding of of where they want to fit into the industry. I think that's the that's that's the difficult piece. I'm I'm sort of mentoring somebody um, who I actually recruited 20 years ago into the military, the female who. She um, she's a physical training instructor now. She does it part time, but she's supported her family for the past like um, twenty years or you know as such. Wants she's in her thirties now. Wants to get into the industry. She came to see me the other week. We sat down, had a coffee. It's like why do you get into infosec? It was only then when I'm chatting to her, thinking, what's going to be best for you? What's your best route into market? How you you know where do you want to? You know, like we said, we could stack these books twenty meters high. Which which book do you want to pull out? Which area do you want to work in? Is it infosec? Is it hacking? Is it coding? Is it you know? It's hard to put people on that on that journey when they don't know the industry themselves. So I think doing the fundamentals of of cybersecurity courses, which are l loads of free material on YouTube, and I, I've spent the last sort of four to six weeks just signposting. Um, I'm not sure what Mammy's saying, but signposting the name's Laura. Signposting Laura to these these areas to just to have a feel for what she might like. And then, you know, you don't want to spend an inordinate amount of money doing some technical courses that are just not fit for you. Because you don't need to go down that route. You can you can go in all sorts of areas. So I think getting the foundations, get it all free, find out where you think you want to be, and invest in yourself that way. And certainly if you're ex military veteran, go through tech vets. Yeah. So. What did you say? Yeah. So, and so yeah, we've got. Um, so it's interesting. Um, you know, Bridewell um, massively support the Armed Forces Network. Um, they they've opened a. Um, we we have an academy scheme, um, which um, anyone can go. You know, you can apply and join. They've just had a partnership with. Um, it is Firebrand, uh, a leading training provider. So. Firebrand providing training for um, new new applicants for graduates to go through that. Um, I think it's like a three month training program, and the opportunity to maybe after that training program come into the workplace, or if not into our workplace, signpost them to another workplace as well. So, you know, I think Bridal really support that academic future, and it's not just for you, not just for young people. I was keen. I reached out to the CEO the other, the other week and said, "Is this just for junior people?" And he said, "Absolutely not. This is for anybody. You know, it'd be, it'd be wrong to to do that. You know, graduate doesn't mean you're 21 and you just left university. It means you're retraining. You're wanting to do something else. And the industry needs, you know, mature as well. You know, you need some, you know, mature thinkers um, with a bit of a different background. They offer a, a different set of skill sets. Um, so yeah, um, lots of routes to market." As I said, loads of routes to market. Yeah, it's the challenge, isn't it? Is is understanding what options are there when you when you're in. You understanding what options are out there to go and to consider, and then try and get a feel for each one. As you said, really difficult sometimes, or a lot of time. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to learn by doing, right? And um, there's uh, I know I mean there's all sorts of free free course and training providers out there. I mean, in terms of the software side, like the co the Code Academy is a classic. Code Academy, yeah. Code Academy yeah. is a classic one. Um, but there's loads of, and you can, I think people are definitely more now, I think, more, 
willing to spend time when they're still in do it be more active and learning about things yeah and going and doing some work on the side like i know a I I w- did some work last uh, the year before last, and uh, it was over about six six nine months TV in, in TV and film it was, and there was a guy there was a guy that was coming on and working on that on, on the weekends, and he was like a serving PTI, and he's not getting out, he's not leaving the military, yeah, but yeah. he's just oh, I'll go and do this and just see what the industry's like, just because down the line if and when he decides to leave, he's had an incl- he's had an insight into it, he's built his network up as well, there's more people in it, and he and, and, and he'll he'll be able to tick that. Take it off as an option or cross it off as a not an option. It's the same with uh, like cybersecurity now. There's so many, there's so many ex mil. There's, well, there's a lot of ex mil in it. It can't be hard to find someone who's, like yourself who's willing to, you know, impart some advice and information and guidance on it, especially to to explain the different avenues you can explore within the industry. Yeah, I spend a lot of time on whether it be LinkedIn for military people reaching out saying, "What should I do next?" What course of action? What course should I do to get me a job? You know, what, you know, and it's and it's diff. It's not difficult, um, but it just identifies the problem that they don't know what commercial cyber looks like. It's we, you know we've branded cyber and therefore it becomes a technical problem. Apparently, you know, it's, it, that's it, it throws connotations of technical coding and. You know, we miss out on some absolute talent, certainly from all the armed forces sectors, in all the trades across, you know, from AGCs to engineers, all that experience that they can bring from the management, the leadership, the security. They know the, the fundamentals of security and the management of fundamentals of security is across most of the service lines. All we've got to do is just tap in to give them a little bit more extra knowledge in these areas. Um, and it's not difficult, you know, I've, I've done it. <laughs> so if I can do it and I'm the thicket from Yorkshire, um, anybody can do it. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think people and people, uh, who are, who are in, they, they don't realize how, like they may be, I mean, let's take cybersecurity as an example, right? They may not have the, any technical, any knowledge, not technical, any knowledge whatsoever of cybersecurity, information security. All they know about is some abbreviation that maybe is linked with Information security and it's GDPR. I don't. Want, I don't know what that means, but I can't share some fucking information of personnel records or whatever, right? But I think where we undersell ourselves certainly is you mentioned it there, like the leadership management piece, the leadership management, the teamwork, right? Because I think employers are much more willing if you can demonstrate to an employer or they know from things like the Armed Forces Employee Recognition Scheme, Armed Forces Covenant, all those kind of schemes, they know that ex-military leaving have experience at all levels, at yeah. all levels, even just as a Tom as a private, of some element of leadership and management and the and like the 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 the, the ways to do it well and the ways to do it badly. Because everyone's either had a shocking commander or They've had a great commander, or they've, or they've been leading themselves, that side. And then the teamwork piece, like one thing, everybody who leaves the military, whether you did a year and then you know maybe you've got basketball and training, I did three or four years, you know how how to integrate yourselves into the team and work together to achieve a common goal. You know how to break Absolutely. down tasks between each other. You know how to identify who is good at what. You, need, you know how to uh, analyze what the problem is and decide how to approach it. And we do that at every level, Yeah, every level. And the further the training they go, you're better at it. And the reason I'm saying it is you've got all, everyone has all that experience. So if you go and hit and step into a, you know, step into an interview scenario or, you know, you introduce someone in the network like yourself um, who knows your ex-military and, and so knows some of the gaps there, they're much more willing to take someone who's got, they maybe haven't got the level of knowledge or experience in the industry mm-hmm. that you would like them to, but you know that because of their background, ex-military, their leadership management and teamwork abilities are fucking far and above what their civilian counterpart may or may not have. No, makes sense. Uh, it, it absolutely makes sense, and and I think it'll boil back as well to the values upon which that they've been ingrained within, the discipline, that selfless commitment, the bits to just drive them on a little bit further, supporting others. You know that selfless commitment bit to just just support others and do things for others is is is, is you know is, is really is really key. But yeah, I think. It takes, but you, if, we, if we hark back and think, it wasn't, not everybody's got those values. 
not everybody's got all the, the courage of self. You know, in, in Civvy Street, we, we don't follow those. So, you know, it takes a long time to ingrain those values, even in soldiers. But you buy by them, you learn by them, and you trained on them. Then you come into Civvy Street and go, what What are your values? And, you know, we talk about, you know, values and standards within the commercial sectors. Every company I've been with, they talk about the values and standards. I try and say, well... <coughs> Knowing how long it takes an individual to really understand and follow those values and standards, it, it, it's a long time, and it's not just words on a page. It's training. It's holding them to account against the standards. Um, that's really, really difficult for companies, I think, to try and push on to, to the workforce. But it's, it's doable, but you've got to keep reinforcing what your standards are what your objectives are, your visions, your missions, and work to those standards within the business. But you've got to keep educating your, the, your staff and workforce to do that. It's uh, And you'll never get to the standard of what the military is. Because no, never. The, because the, the implications of getting it wrong or having a bad actor within your team Doesn't in Civvy Street, the implication of doing it compared to the military is, is so much different. In the military, if you get it wrong, the, the worst case scenario is you ain't, you ain't here anymore, you yeah, know, yeah. or you, you, you part of your team's not you anymore because they're dead. Whereas in the civil street, you don't, you don't get that. But I mean, to, it also fluctuates between people in the military, right? You get more ons as well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, get, you get more ons, complete more ons. Yeah. High but, uh, rate in the eh? a high bell end rate. There is a high bell end rate. There is a high bell end rate, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 it is one thing. It is one thing that surprised me <clears throat> that I found really frustrating early on when I when I got my first normal job was uh, <clears throat> to point out like the accountability was how little accountability, how little people were held to account for making mistakes. Uh, I, I, my first proper job was as a health and safety manager for not a small company, and um, I was way out of my depth, way out of my depth, and. Uh, and I remember someone, someone made a mistake. It cost about 30, he lost the company about 30 grand, which in the grand scheme of things wasn't a huge amount of money for what their revenue was. But they made a mistake. It was obviously made a mistake. It cost 30 grand. That, that 30 grand came out of someone's pot. Nothing happened about it. Nothing yeah. happened. They weren't held to account. There wasn't even any retraining or nothing. No discipline whatsoever. <clears throat> and I couldn't believe it. And it made me realize how important it is to have that, that, uh, accountability for your own actions within you. Yeah, yeah. Like, because if, if you make a mistake and you're not getting held to account, then you're just going to go and do it again. <clears throat> if, if you haven't got those values and standards and ethics like built into you, for, for, ingrained into you yeah. from when you were, you know, from a previous life. And uh, I find that um, when I moved to the company I'm in now, I stepped into, so in my, I work for Imarsat, and I stepped onto a team or a department which was quite heavy and heavily ex-military. Not heavily ex-military. There was a significant proportion of ex ex-military there. The the president of the of the department was ex-military, and the attitude within that unit was so far different to what I've ever experienced before. Because people, and this was the civilian, most of them were civilians. No one ever. Most people hadn't had an ex-military background, but because of the way the president conducted himself, and the way that the other ex-military they conducted themselves, people were much more open and honest about discussing issues or mistakes that have been made and holding themselves accountable and wanting to improve on something or prevent themselves making a mistake on the line. Yeah. It was a really interesting working environment, a really positive working environment to be in. It had, I mean, it was, uh, it was difficult. It was a difficult business unit to be in because of the nature of the work. But it was really good to be there. You like, you, you, I think people were more trusting of each other in what, each other would say or do or think or offer up opinions on things because they knew just there's a bit more honesty going on there. People who hold themselves more accountable. It was a better environment yeah. to work in. No, that, that honesty and trust is absolutely mm -hmm. fundamental to that. I think the, the the trouble I sometimes have is coming that when you, I think when you've done a certain amount of time, you become you can be slightly arrogant and overconfident in your ability. So if you're new into the industry. Certainly, you know, you've done, you know, you've got to the top of your tree. You've been and done your objectives every year. You've done every course. You're nailing it. You are the kingpin. And when you get into that civilian environment, it's not so much you're no longer the kingpin, but the, I think the attitudes continue or that, that dominance, that confidence levels are there, which is great in some respects. 
but I have to tailor it down sometimes with the, with the guys that come in and you know just just temper it a little bit. So some of the attitudes and some of the sort of ways of working, you know, which they're not used to, and it's it, I almost feel like you have to coach a little bit sometimes, coach them into the the business world. That's all you're doing. It's just tweaking them down a little bit, uh, and then you know I was exactly the same. You know, sometimes if you think you're Billy Big Balls, you've been up there, don't you? You've been the Sergeant Major, you've been the OC, and then you're not Billy Big Balls anymore. You are literally part of the workforce, but you've got to use all the good skills and then those discipline areas, those values. You've got to bring that to the front and just step it down a bit, tone it down a bit. It's a bitter pill to swallow, that is. It's a hard, bitter, isn't it? A bitter pill to swallow. Well, it's life, isn't it? Yeah. Hard. Yeah. You realise that you're not Billy Big Balls anymore. I did not enjoy swallowing that pill. <laughs> Were you Billy Big Balls? I know. Well, I thought it was. <laughs> I was. Listen, mate, I was a sergeant. I'm going to walk straight into the oh. best job ever. I'm amazing. You, you know you, what I do? Do you know I was in the Paris. I was amazing. I'm going to yeah. go straight into, uh, you know, a leadership position, a management position. Oh, yeah. No dramas whatsoever in the industry. I don't understand. Yeah, you're going to see you later, see you. Why aren't you responding to my CV? <laughs> <laughs> why is respond to my job application? Who was I talking to? Uh, I can't mention the name. There's someone who's got, I'll mention you, you after. He might. I was, uh, there was a guy who, long story short, <clears throat> Billy Big Bollock Syndrome, got out Billy Big Bollock Syndrome, and he had, he applied for a couple of jobs to a, a security company, a big security company, applied for a couple of jobs to them. They didn't, they didn't get back to him. And I remember him telling me this, and he was whinging about him. He's fucking, not getting back to me, it's bollocks. They should, they should respond to job you know, application. I was like, mate, you think about how many applications mm -hmm. they get, you're not going to get a response. Right? Fast forward about a month, they ring him to offer him a job, which he hadn't applied for, a different job. And he told him to bugger off. He said, no, nope, not interested. You couldn't bother to return my calls. You've lost me. You've lost me. You've lost me. And bear <laughs> in mind, he was unemployed. <laughs> he had no job. I was like, oh my God. Just but in that mindset, yeah. in that mindset. You know, the reality is when you leave, to most people, you're just you're just another person, right? They, if they find out you're ex-military, that that sparks a little bit of interest in them, maybe, which they may vocalise, they may not, but they certainly don't understand that you have real significant experience that is applicable in civvy street in the working environment because they don't understand it. They they, they don't they can't see that, yeah. and it and it's really hard to convey that to convey that to people if you don't understand it yourself and two if you do understand it in a way that isn't give me a job I'm fucking awesome because that's not what it is which comes to I mean I know that Bridewell are going through the armed forces employee recognition scheme process now got bronze already got yeah. bronze already right yeah. and and so yeah. I've so in my sat doing the same uh, going through the process and what that's I did pay it a bit of lip service before I came to the job I was in now because I was like, oh, God, people just want that badge because it looks good for a company, blah, blah, blah. But from what I've seen internally with it, where I work is that actually it's a really good way to educate to, to educate like the workforce who could be interviewing an ex-soldier or ex-sailor or ex-man or woman. Great point. Yeah. Because they understand, it, they understand it better. Like our HR department is all over. They, they really actively um, they put in extra effort to try and, if they get an application from a C, from someone of the ex-military and there's something on that they don't understand, that they go, I don't, and it looks like it could be suited to the role, but something they don't, they don't understand, they'll they'll come and ask someone of the ex-military in the business. Yeah. Hugh, what does this mean? This says you're a combat engineer, or this says you're this course or whatever. What, what is this? What, what does it mean? I have to explain it to them. They go, okay, all oh, right, I understand. And they, they, it's, it's really good. And they do that because of things like Armed Forces Employee Recognition Scheme, which gets you to actively engage with the ex-military in your workforce and just they understand it better. It's really good. Yeah, and, and Bride will really support that that journey. We've got, a, I say, a small team. There's probably, you know, you know probably about 3% of us within the business now, um, ex-service, ex-servicemen and, and women. Um, 3%, 3%? I think it's about 3%. I'm trying to look at the numbers, I think. I look at the group that I'm sort of managing. Uh, I think there's about, about 20 in there. The company's what? 200 plus so yeah so we're probably getting on about two two three percent of the the business and it's growing i think um but the, you know bridal really support it you know full terms of reference are in place we 
we try and do a lot of the briefs. We have people that are joining the, the group for family and friends. The grandparents were in. They've got, you know, they really want to be part of that 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 group and understand more about what we do. Um, so we're in the fledgling stages of doing that. Um, be great, you know, again, linking up with other industries and other sectors to join those partnerships to learn about what it looks like and, you know, cross-skilling between these between us would be absolutely fantastic. But it's, it is a journey for us. Um, and it's really weird that, you know, not all service people want to join, want to be in the forces network, strangely enough. I've, which I can, You mean I can, your internal military network? Yeah, some, yeah. some of the internal, like, do you know what, I don't really want to be part of that. Or reluctantly turn up because it's like, no, I've, I've dropped that. I dropped that when I left and when I handed my ID card in. I don't want to be part of it. You know, you, I didn't want to try and leave it behind. So I'm equally educating the internal people about the benefits of what it's about as well as the company and the people around it. Um, I don't want it to be a, a sort of big thing within the business uh, and, and, and over, you know, make it too sort of, I mean, that's too popular, but it's not, it's, 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 really, it's really good that we do these things, but I don't want it to be a thing. It's just a group of ex-service people getting together, doing the right things in the right environment, being supported, by the managers and leaders and just helping them out where they can to just refine these edges, support them in the business environment. Uh, yeah. And just keep that culture there for them. I just, um, but I don't want it to be this big, you know, we're all military and, you know, want to keep that, that, that arm badge on. You don't turn up every day. And as soon as we go into the, the teams meeting, try and become the squaddy again, which is what people might actually think, you know, as soon as you get on there, you're throwing banter around. Um, I don't want to get into that. Really. It's really dangerous. dangerous. It's just, it is dangerous. It's almost like you don't want it to be the opportunity to become that squaddy again. You, it's not that environment. It's um, it's a different. It's a different uh, kettle of fish for me. Yeah, we I we we I was, I know what you mean about not people not wanting to get involved. We're going to finish off in a minute. But people not wanting to get involved. We've got about I think we're at ten percent, ten eleven percent of the of the workforce. We're two thousand strong. Ten ten or eleven percent are military. Or ex-military, or serving reservist, or a spouse of someone who's military, or a cadet instructor. You know all the the, uh, the criteria for the employee recognition scheme. So about so that's about two hundred people, right, mm -hmm. across the globe. But most of us are UK based. All that two hundred, we've got maybe fifty who are actively involved with the network. And to your point, not everyone wants to do it. But also Same. part of the network is we we have a lot of staff who are part of it and and just take part in the events and stuff. Um, who aren't ex-military just because they, they they like to be part of it and learn and hear the way because the way we interact and because it's very different it's very different we find it's really good yeah. for, for, for the internal um, camaraderie and stuff you know I'd, I'd prefer it the other way around where there was more non-military people that were joining the, the group mm. so we could learn off each other mm. you know you don't want to bring all those tra you don't want to bring all the traits I mean we've got some brilliant traits we've gone through them all some brilliant traits but equally there's some bad ones as well. <laughs> so, you know, bringing that together, looking themselves in the mirror and going, I'm, I'm actually, a, I'm a bit of a dick that way. <laughs> yeah, I've still got that. And looking at everybody and going, oh, I'm, yeah, I've still got that. Yeah. So I just, you know, I'd like to bring the wider audience into our group and refine refine us down a little bit as well sometimes. Um, What else? What have we not covered you want to cover? How do people, so, uh, how do people... F find you, find Bridewell, and find out about the academy you mentioned that you're setting up. So yeah, um, all through LinkedIn. You know, Bridewell's you know got a, quite a big footprint. Um, go to the website um, Bridewell.com. You'll see all the services that we you know that the that we offer, the managed services, the cybersecurity, the pen testing, all those elements that give you an idea of what Bridewell really is about. To be fair, you know, a good view of what the cyber industry is doing at this moment in time. Um, I think once you've seen the services, you'll understand where you might want to be and how you want to progress career options. I think the next piece is then going into the, um, rather going onto the website and putting some contact details in, going onto the social media. And there's a big presence and it shows you around, you know, some of the initiatives that that bride will are pushing in terms of its academies and um, and graduate sort of schemes. So I'd, I'd implore everyone to just have a look at those and, and, and search around. And equally, just, just you can see me on the social media on LinkedIn. Um, TikTok. 
not TikTok. <laughs> I am not a TikTok man. Yeah, the I'm only sure TikTok I, I do. I saw. I'm sure. I'm sure. I saw you doing that. The the, the uh, Wednesday Adams dance <laughs> on TikTok. I saw it. With the bright belt T-shirt on. I'm joking. Do you know what we were in? Uh, we were in the offices in um, in, the, in our London offices the other the other week on Wednesday, and I'm like the I am like literally the old man. Genuinely, I am like Father Time of the business. I think I am Father Time, and um, so I'm in the middle floor, and, and there's like two floors of TikTok because TikTok's in the same building. Oh right. So um, and, and and again, I can, uh, I'm still shocked, <laughs> genuinely shocked. At three o'clock, the bar opens in the office. I'm like, really. Like three or four o'clock, the bars open, free... B- the, the TikTok office? Just, it's like a... Oh, you know, you can you imagine these films that you watch where people are on beanbags playing Space Invaders and yeah. playing table tennis? I've seen Facebook HQ, it's like that. Oh. Ah. Yeah. And I'm walking around in my um, tweed, you know. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> my tweed and mustard trousers. Um, <coughs> and everyone, everyone's at least 30 years younger than me going, what's Father Time doing in this office? Drinking our beer, sitting on our beanbags. Get rid of him. Who are you? <laughs> so, but I quite like it. I quite like it. It's it's fun. I think that's re- I think that's a really good point. You know, sometimes about th- that transition with the guys. You know, coming coming in when they're seeing younger people, really good quality, solid technical people in a different environment. It's absolutely. You know, there's, w- there's a guy last week just coming. He's ex REF. Um, it was his first day on Wednesday in the office, looking around. His, his, his eyes were like, you know, saucepans. Like, what environment is this? So this is the TikTok environment, young. <laughs> this is a TikTok environment, young man. Get used to it and get me a beer while you're at it. So uh, does the bar generally open at three? I think it's three. Oh my god! Oh, I should three. not work in that workplace. I should not work there. Never go in there. Uh, yeah, no. it's just it's bad. Yeah, I say, what do they do? I was going, what do they do? What are they doing all day in there? What are all these social media people doing, TikTokers? So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. But, yeah, what a, what, a, what a place to be. What an exciting, exciting times and what a place to be. It's brilliant. Definitely. It's been a pleasure, mate. No, thank you. It's been you. a pleasure. No, cheers thank for you for inviting me down. Much appreciated. And uh, good luck with all the uh, the Armed Forces initiatives. Very well. Yeah, that should be good. Hoping to come back here maybe this summer, get something set up. Um, oh, yeah. Have a few socials. Oh, the Rugby for Heroes Festival. Rugby for Heroes. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Might even bring my boots. Yeah. Good. Bring I, them. I think bring not. Them. <laughs> we're after a water boy. Gum yeah. Shield. Gum, gum shield. Yeah, I get a gum shield after this. After this we podcast, need, I'll probably need a. I need headgear and a gum shield. The last, the last Rugby for Heroes festival. No, the one before last. I mean, we talked about it just quickly. We played. So our Force of Barbarians, right? We turn, the, when we play, the, t- the players just turn up on the morning. We don't have any training sessions. And you, basically, people get prioritised if they've never played for us before. And if they're near the venue. So it's just about the inclusive rugby. For people who can't, so, so for people who can't go and uh, like commit to training twice a week for the local club, but they want to play rugby. Yeah, yeah. So they can come and play for Forces Barbarians. We rocked up. We, got, we did a completely mismatched fixture. And it was Forces Barbarians, who are, who are mostly... Veterans age, 35 plus, right? Yeah. Versus Pacific Islanders Rugby Club. Oh, nice. My God. My God. Honestly, they turned up, got on the pitch, and it was just fucking carnage. Carnage. We had a lacerated, I think it was the first half, lacerated eyeball, discate finger, fractured femur. That was all on our side. And it was people who played that match who never played, they haven't played rugby since they were kids. Since they were kids. Nightmare. It was like, oh yeah, nightmare. When, when's your next one? I don't one? know what the point I was making there. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not playing them again. Are they, not? they play all the time and they're all, they're all like Fijian Samoans, yeah, yeah. well, Pacific Islanders. Units. Yeah. Units. Absolute units. Anyway. I'll dodge that bullet, but thank you very much. Yeah, completely off topic there. No, thanks, mate. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here, around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear, if not, if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast, on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's everywhere. It's on all of the, uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H-Hour. Becoming a patron of H-Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, 
exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about five, ten minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast starts getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about ten minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they're only released to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Hey Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N, patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.